Hi, my name is Natalie Fikach, and I'm a part of the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, and I serve as one of the school mental health leads. And my background is public education, um, having served as a teacher, professional school counselor, campus and district level administrator. Um, I'm passionate about supporting students and staff in the school mental health space. Hi, I'm Amanda Boquist. I um, am also part of the school mental health team. I have worked in education for about 13 years now um, in various roles from uh, supporting counselors um, being on campus as well as um, with the district level and now supporting school mental health um, in our region. Seasonal affective disorder, or also known as seasonal depression, um, is just a type of depression that typically happens during specific seasons of the year, most frequently during fall and winter. The thought is that the shorter days and less sunlight triggers a, a chemical change in our brain, uh, leading to symptoms of depression. So it's thought to affect serotonin and melatonin. Um, serotonin leads us to happy feelings and feelings of well-being and more serotonin is developed during higher light days and then when there's less daylight um, there's actually more melatonin that's created in our brain uh, which can lead to feelings of sleepiness uh, or you know sadness and depression and our body naturally makes more when it's dark outside so days are shorter and darker um, we become more prevalent to seasonal affective disorder So as parents, caregivers, professional educators, um, you might notice a few things in your classroom or on your campus. Um, you might see students who are coming to school more lethargic or more tired because their sleeping patterns have been um, disrupted. You might see students who were more likely to get their homework or assignments turned in, and then now all of a sudden they're not turning in their assignments. And so you'll see changes in mood. Uh, you could characterize that by saying that you have students who feel like they're more hopeless, um, they're more discouraged, they're more self-critical, um, who may cry or get upset more easily. So you may see an escalation in behaviors. You also might see a change, like if you happen to be on cafeteria duty or in the cafeteria, students who seem to be wanting to eat more carbohydrates because that's gonna give them the quick amount of energy that they might need that their brain is craving. And overarching all of that, you're probably also gonna see students who are having trouble concentrating and really not able to really put their finger on what's going on or why they're not able to concentrate because sad can make it hard to focus. But if you really pay close attention and you watch a student, when that uh, sunlight increases again, students will most likely go back to the behaviors that they had uh, before the change in sunlight. Some of the misconceptions that we've heard or seen about SAD uh, the first one is that it only affects people living in really overcast climates, um, so primarily in the Northeast um, or the Midwest where it gets really cold and they have really intense winters. We especially live in, in Texas and, and um, support the South Southwest region, uh, may not have those kinds of climates for a prolonged period of time. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that anybody uh, can experience seasonal affective disorder, um, regardless of where they live. One of the other things that we've seen, one of the other misconceptions is that maybe light therapy is the only effective treatment. There are actually a multitude of treatments, primarily cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. Oftentimes there are supplements, vitamin D supplements that someone could take, as well as antidepressants if it becomes a severe issue. The consideration for light therapy is that it can be helpful, um, but also to be mindful of the fact that not everyone will respond well to light therapy. So those are just some, some things to consider. So Amanda just shared some different treatment options that are available for SAD. And I'm sure that you heard that a lot of those are clinical, which means that we're probably not providing CBT on our campuses. We're probably not 
diagnosings and dispensing medications. Um, but there are some really great things that we can consider on our school campuses. So the first thing to really think about is just to be prepared. Typically, uh, schools create professional development plans uh, in the summer before the school year begins. And so if we know that ahead of time, then we can really create a calendar, a social emotional learning plan, a guidance curriculum plan, and have things in place before the seasons come. And so things that we might do would include talking to our students about coping strategies or different techniques that they can put in place, that we can put in place on our campuses and our classrooms. The second thing that we really need to be sure that we're doing is equipping our staff with knowledge. And so in the beginning of the school year, making sure that they understand about different mental health conditions, providing training for them, giving them tools and techniques that they can use in their classrooms. And also I would mention that while we're talking specifically about students, our adults are probably also feeling these things. And so as school leaders, what are we putting in place to make sure our adults feel supported? Are we um, opening the blinds and if we have blinds or shades in our schools to let in more light? Are we doing outside activities? Are we, are we increasing that amount of exercise, movement, and light when we can that's natural? We might create a Zen Den, which is what we might call a place where our students can go and reset where we might have some um, lighting that's beneficial for students and aromatherapy and places for yoga or mindfulness. And are we uh, ensuring that during those times, as I mentioned earlier about the craving that we have for complex carbohydrates, are we making sure that we have food available in our cafeterias that's gonna kind of combat that and make sure our students are getting good nourishment. So the Mayo Clinic actually recommends that during times of seasonal affective disorder that we increase above and beyond our typical amount of movement an additional 30 minutes. And so what that might look like could be increasing the amount of time we have in physical education classes or we have in gym, whatever you may call it, and or are we increasing uh, the amount of time we have for recess. And what does, and you know, brainstorming with our staff, what does recess look like when it's snowing outside? Um, how can we ensure that there's movement? There's a lot of great programs online from Go Noodle to different YouTube channels that um, offer some quick amount of movement and exercises and things that we can do in our classroom. I would say that data drives decisions. Different data sources that we could look at would include your discipline data from the previous year, your attendance data, your tardy data, even your failure rates. Um, if we're able to paint a picture that there are changes in each of those and we can make that connection that it has something to do with the season, then we're more likely to, likely to be able to make changes. This allows us to really paint a picture that some um, folks might be more likely to listen to. And then we can really put those plans in place that I mentioned in the last question. So surprisingly, there's not that much information out there, like specific to how to support students and work in schools and support adolescents. But one of my most favorite places to find resources related to depression and anxiety for our teens is the Child Mind Institute. Uh, they put out really great resources and one pagers with tools and things that we can do to make sure our students feel seen and supported. Another great tool was put together by the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center that specifically addresses SAD uh, in schools. So you can find the link here. One thing that's been mentioned a couple times in this interview is the importance of our professional educators, making sure that, they're, that they are well taken care of, because if our educators are not well taken care of, they're not gonna be able to take care of their students. And so uh, we have a special offering that will open up in January, January, February, and March of 2024. The South Southwest MHTTC will offer mindful self-compassion for educators. And we have a limited amount of spots available for this opportunity. It will be um, eight three-hour sessions where educators will learn 
um, what self-compassion is. They will practice self-compassion strategies and walk through a research-based curriculum that's going to help them to have a great spring. We hope to see you there.